So welcome. Today we talk with, uh, or I talk with Paul Z. Jackson, co-founder and president of the Applied Improvisation Network. And he's an organizational consultant and has written several books on training, coaching and improvisation. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Jesse. Where are you calling in from? I'm in St. Albans, which is a small city just outside London in the UK. Nice. Is it is it well known? It's well known to me. <laughs> Because for me, it's not really ringing a bell, but it doesn't say yeah. anything. <laughs> it's not. It's not famous. Um, right. It was a Roman town, uh -huh. and St Alban was the first Christian martyr in the United Kingdom. So there's a big cathedral and some very old buildings. It's very pretty. And some tourists come here in the summer as well. But it's not the main tourist destination like Oxford or Bath or London. Yeah. So it carries quite some history. Yeah. Beautiful. So, uh, well, we met, um, I think it was during the Applied Improvisation Network event in Berlin. I think. Yes. When was this? Three years ago. Three years ago. Oh, that's not even that long ago. So uh, that's where we met, and uh, yeah, you're the founder of that, the president. Um, one, one of the founders. One there of were the a, founders. Group, a group of us that founded the AIN <coughs> when we were we met at a, a training conference, a conference for trainers in Florida, mm -hmm. and they'd asked me to organize an improvisation show for mm -hmm. the cabaret for some of us to be in. So we performed this show. And that went very well. And in the bar afterwards, we wondered if there were other people who also ran improvisation workshops for trainers, for leaders, and for managers. Because we didn't know many people who did that and were surprised that there were three or four of us at this same conference. So we uh, decided to put out an email list to our contacts to find out who else was doing this. And Alain Rostan, who was the... Um, American-based one of us uh, created a, a good mailing list and then he got us in to do a stream within another conference to see how many would show up and discuss this kind of way of working. Wow. This was 14 years ago and 30 people came to that very first conference. We were called the Summit for Improvisation in Business at that time. Uh, later we became the Applied Improvisation Network. And it was it was clear we were doing the same thing as each other, but in different ways. So it was very exciting to discover that there were other people who had this same crazy idea that you could take improvisation off of the stage or away from jazz or wherever you might have first found it, perhaps in an art, and use it in business. Right. And our, our second conference was in Toronto, and we had about 90 people came to that. So it was clear that we had our own independent identity and people could come and find their tribe and join right. in yeah and next uh, edition will be in the in oxford right that's right it's yeah. the first time that the conference has come to the uk we go every three years to europe so berlin was the last one in europe there were two in north america uh, san francisco oh no the the last one was in montreal the one before mm -hmm. that was in austin texas The previous American one had been in San Francisco. And it's Europe's turn again, first time in England. And we're going to Keeble College, which is in Oxford University. So it's a marvelous setting, very uh, Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter style. Yeah, I'm actually yeah. planning to go. I have to still double check my schedule, but I yeah. would love to. Uh, I missed some uh, editions because of work and busyness, but now it's so near and I always am intrigued by Oxford and the whole, you know, the university city that it has uh, its own spheres and all that. I'm always interested to see that. So let's combine the, you know, it's exactly both opportunities. Yes. So, uh, people yeah. like you, they come back to the conference maybe every few years and are amazed at how much development there's been mm -hmm. in the application of improvisation into different fields, different areas, and how much more skillful the facilitators and the trainers are coming. So you get a lot of learning from peers and sharing of cases and picking up tips. And as, as I'm sure you remember, it's also a lot of fun. Yes, it is indeed. <laughs> it was amazing. 
Um, so getting back to uh, or to get back to the start, like I know what you're doing kind of, but some people <laughs> might have, have never met you, do not really know what improv is and they're interested in new leadership development. And I personally think it fits in perfectly um, to actually give the floor to people to to let them um, experience a process and let the process to be the focus of the way we work and not so much only the outcome that has to be in place. Um, so how did you get in this, this field? So the bold question is actually, why do you do what you do? <laughs> <laughs> I always like that one. People know this uh, by now. <laughs> I'm going to take the easier question of how did I get into this field? Okay. Uh, I <laughs> The first step in was watching improvisation on stage and being really impressed. My background was in journalism. That's what I did after I left university. And I was interested in the arts, you know, gone to see plenty of shows. And, I th and I'd been in some shows and been involved in putting shows on as well. And I thought that a good show had to be written, rehearsed and directed. And this improvisation show that I went to wasn't written, it was made up on the spot. It wasn't rehearsed, they didn't practice doing that show. It was fresh, first time they'd done it. And it wasn't directed, it was co-created by the people in it. So all of that should have been either impossible or very bad. But it was really good. <laughs> How is this possible? <laughs> How is it possible? I was very suspicious as a journalist. So I went again <laughs> to the show the next week and it was a completely different show, of course, just as good. And I used my journalist card to interview the people who put the show on. And they told me it's actually really very easy. <laughs> you just say yes and and. <laughs> and if, you, if you want to go further, there's a book by Keith Johnston called Impro. Yep. And so I bought that book and I went to a couple of workshops because I was really intrigued at how this could, could work and be so good. So it challenged a lot of my preconceptions. And then, because the workshops were in London and I was working in Cardiff, which was a couple of hours away, um, it was easier to start my own group to explore improvisation. And I did this at the Chapter Arts Centre in Cardiff and some people came along and we explored improvisation. And then we were invited to perform as the support group for a couple of shows that were performing in that theatre. So we did some impro on stage, <laughs> that was another step for me. And then over the next few years, I trained three groups of improvisers to perform in different cities. I moved to Manchester, where I was working for the BBC as a comedy producer. And then when I became a freelance trainer and consultant, I moved to Bath and had a group in Bath and Bristol. So I had a lot of experience in training people to be stage improvisers, doing mostly short form. We experimented with some longer shows. So these are all shows where the audience maybe makes a suggestion or two and then the group will create comedy or drama on the spot between, between themselves. Amazing. And then at BBC, uh, we, I was going on a training course, a management training course, and they asked us to offer what we could um, teach to anybody else on the course. So the participants taught each other different things. And I was really struggling as to what I could offer. <laughs> Maybe I'll show them some of these improvisation activities. And they loved them. And it really became apparent that these were good tools for people to communicate in teams, find their creativity, present more confidently. And that was the seed for becoming an applied improviser, teaching people to use it for non-theatrical purposes. And then the, the final step was meeting other people who did that and creating an organization that brought the people who do the applied improvisation together into a network. Beautiful. And, um, and, and can you, when was, when was this, when you made the switch? Do you remember? Yeah. Um, Which year so, more or less? Yes, it was in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. That's when I left the BBC and started the third group and began doing public workshops. Okay. For improvisation for life well um, for me if i hear you telling this story and your background and 
to be honest, we do not know each other by heart. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, grabbing this in the moment, uh -huh. as improvisers do. Um, exactly. I feel that w the space where you're in right now really combines all components of maybe your passion, your talent, um, uh, your contribution to the world uh, to make it maybe big. But I think it's very important uh, that you have this, you know, purpose. Um, and also perhaps in a way that suits you, you know, it sounds that you do not have a nine to five job. So, no. <laughs> it, so you're kind of tapping into your purpose and unlocking yes. your potential by that. Is yes. that, is that something that if you connect the dots, you can really, that makes sense for you? Yes. That, I would say that's very resonant. It's a perceptive comment that I've somehow luckily found my way to doing this thing that suits me and I enjoy doing and it, it makes some contribution and it, it makes a living as well. So it's uh, a, a great uh, way of spending my time and uh, enjoying myself. I only do the work that's interesting and ch uh, challenging. And of course, the, all the applied improvisation network work is voluntary. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the organization is paid apart from our administrator, who we have one day per week. Mm -hmm. and our web designer, who's a professional that we pay. But all the board members are doing it because we want to do it, and we do it voluntarily, um, because it's a, an exciting area of development. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And um, if we go back to the improvisation part, um, well, I know I've listened to your podcasts um, of the, the Solution Focus method, mm -hmm. if I can call it like that. Yes. Um, so, what's the link with that method and improv for you? Um, I'm going to go back with a bit more history then. Sure. Into some <laughs> some writing, and when I became a trainer, I started to train people in um, presentation skills and also training trainers. Mm -hmm. to be more confident in front of a group, and how to design training. And I was very surprised that the things I was sharing with them were really very new to them, and they hadn't experienced that in their own training careers, usually. And that struck me as quite odd. And I'd come into training not through an industrial route or an organizational route, but through comedy, <laughs> comedy and journalism. So I'd done a very different strand of work to get there. And... I realized that what I was doing was in some way different, so I wrote about it. And my first book was The Inspirational Trainer, and that's a, a guide to how to train using improvisational ideas in the training mm. right from the outset. And one of the people that I worked a lot with at that time was called Mark McCurgo, and we shared interests in, in the training world, also in football. I was running an impro performing group on the stage. He was running an improvised musical modern jazz orchestra nice which was very <laughs> yeah nice one way of describing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's my reference again i mean my dad is a yes. jazz musician so i can see all those things combining easily the sports, they were very good the, they were the very music good. the theater yeah. <laughs> yes not to everybody's taste but a modern jazz ensemble and um, Mark introduced me to this idea of solution focus, which um, his partner, I think, had found out about through being a counsellor. And solution focus, brief therapy, brief as in short, was uh, a very small strand of fairly radical therapy coming out of the United States, led by Steve Tshazza and Insu Kimberg, who taught it and wrote about it and practiced it. And we were very struck by how simple and elegant the solution-focused ideas were. And a lot of them were about making use of clients' resources, as opposed to, for example, doing an analysis of the problems that the people had. They'd find out what people's resources were and how they could make use of them to get closer to what they wanted. So this idea of making use of resources sounds very much like a good definition of improvisation. Yep. How do you make use of what's there? Um, Mark and I developed solution-focused ideas for the organizational world. And we co-wrote a book called The Solutions Focus, 
making coaching and change simple. So there's a whole methodology of change there in which improvisation pulses as a sort of um, heartbeat or inspiration and as a, a set of ideas and tools that fit very well within a solution-focused approach to change. So I've been working with both. They've, they've got different flavors, different titles, but they combine in many coherent and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And with the solution focus um, method, do you, to, to translate it to some concrete practices maybe, do you use like power questions or reflective questions to actually mirror people and to go back into their own tapping into their own poten potential resources, what's, what's actually there, like you mentioned? Or will you really do exercises with them as we might know them as applied improvisation exercises? Both. Or both. Yeah. both. Uh, you can use solution focus as a one-to-one -one individual conversation, mm -hmm. for example, in coaching, or in teams, team coaching, or working with organizations, or even working with communities. Mm -hmm. So you do ask questions or you do activities to find the answer to what do people want and what resources do they have that's useful in achieving the sorts of things that they want and in articulating what progress would look like so people have a sense of what to do. Yeah, That's yeah. very improvisational. You don't have a big plan about what you're going to do. You have a direction you know you want to go in mm -hmm. and then you take small steps and adjust and respond and adapt along the way. These are the improvisational skills. Yes, you have to be both very them, present. So, <laughs> importantly, both of them are interactional. They're about what you do in response to what I do, in response to what you do, and in response to the world around us and the context we find ourselves. So any solution-focused project, just like any improvisation activity, is unique in yeah. how how it turns out this time. I love the way you say that interactional, um, that is actually we influencing our world and our world is influencing, influencing us. It's kind of the social yeah. constructivism. Uh, what's that? Yes, it is. Yes. I, discovered, I discovered the theory later. Yes, it's so always it's funny how that works, right? I always search for the theoretical frameworks uh, later. So yes. there's other people that are in the same space. This is actually yes. how I work too. Yes. Well, I'm also a sociologist, so I should have known this on forehand. Yes. And I read a little bit about Foucault. I don't know if you know the philosopher, but he's I also do. really championing this uh, yeah, post-positivism uh, discourse. But yes. without making it too complex, it's it's also really about, I always say, it's also really about the mindset and your environment. I mean, if your mindset becomes more positive, or in your case, um, uh, yeah, positive, solution, positive. Solution focused. Yeah, exactly. That's sort of how you influence how you see the world, and yes. that world will transform, and that will have an impact on you again. So it's kind yes. of this good way of self-fulfilling prophecy that you create I, I don't want to downsize it by this, saying this because for some people self-fulfilling prophecy is something negative but I mean it in a positive way um, and this is how you can yeah really unlock uh, the energy and and supportive um, uh, yeah mechanisms in in people in a workspace and that accelerates again it does yes on its um, what, what we pay attention to makes a difference and Wittgenstein, another philosopher, he said, the world of the happy is not the same as the world of the unhappy. Definitely. And if you ask people questions about what helps them flourish, what helps them thrive, what makes them happy, you get a very different conversation from what's making you miserable, what's stopping you, yeah. what barriers. And that's the difference between solution focus and a problem focus. Yeah, I, I remember I did this, ex this exercise with Janine. Janine? Yes, my correct. business partner in the Solutions Focus. Exactly. Janine, Janine Waldman. Yeah. And one side you do like, oh, you know, have empty glass. And the other yes. way is how you put the questions in, in a positive way. It's very nice. And it's actually contagious because before you know, it's there in your vocabulary. And it's yes. like, you know, I had some friends that told me, Jess, when are you real and when are you working? I'm like, I don't know. It's. Yes. <laughs> it's become part of me. Yes. And is there something bad about it? You know, yeah. 
if you go back to your question of why do we do this? Yeah, interesting. And we see that transformation in people or in teams. It's very exciting. And people will say, this, this changed my life. So it's, it's very gratifying. And yet the, the ideas are really quite simple. They're still a minority pursuit. I don't think many people know about these ideas. Mm -hmm. Even some people that know about them don't use them. So there's great demand for it and great need for it in organizations. I agree, definitely. I'm always stunned that people are like, my God, the question, why do I do what I do? You know, these kind of things. Maybe it's not even solution focused yet, but it could be like, uh, you know, a starting point for people to tap into their uh, subconscious. Uh, that could already change, you know, a lot for them. Yeah. We, we say we're changing the world one conversation at a time. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and that's very improvisational as well. It's not a grand scheme. It's having a conversation with someone and paying attention to that conversation in the moment as to the next small thing that can make a useful difference. Yeah. Yeah, I, I work a lot with innovators and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I often also say this is kind of the entrepreneurial mindset or behavior or attitude you can uh, adopt, whoever you are. I think it's always, uh, you know, beneficial. And, um, yeah, it makes you focus on what's possible. On, um, and also every moment can be very rich, you know, with yes. whomever you talk. It could be yes. a high-end director. It could be anyone in the organization. You kind of have... A guide for yourself to ask these questions so it can always be resourceful and then the other thing that the improvisation adds is the skills mm -hmm. so the organization maybe gets the idea that it needs to be changing or adapting and use its resources but it maybe doesn't know how to do that mm -hmm. and improvisers are very good at practices of being in the moment and listening to what people are saying and building on them so we're teaching the skills as well as some of the models when we do an improvisation workshop. Yeah. And to go back to something you were asking before about the nature of the work, mm -hmm. it's not just asking questions, mm -hmm. though that's important. It's doing activity that gives people experience and skills that they can reapply in the day-to-day -day work. Or if you're doing some consulting, I was doing some work with uh, an organization a couple of weeks ago, and we weren't teaching them solution focus. We were doing activities in groups mm -hmm. about what they would do next week at work in order to have more productive meetings and nice. encourage their team members to feel more um, engaged, engaged in the work that yeah. they would do. So it's all very practical stuff we can use next week. Wow, that's amazing. I feel like I want to take a flight and, <laughs> and work <laughs> with you on the spot. Since we're so in the same, uh, working in the same field, it's uh, it's great. Of course, I knew this uh, before, but but because I'm now really in it, I can make the connections way faster. Yes. So that's uh, with Hosted Transform, as you might have seen the the video too. Um, so maybe some 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 challenges that I bump into once in a while, and that mm. is. You need to be open to grasp or tap into your resources or to obtain these skills or to see the bigger picture and to transform, so to speak. So what if people are really in their heads and they're, you can tell in their body language carefully, of course, you can never know, but you can tell they're judging, you know, everything you do or they think or the world. Um, what is your, your approach to that? I think people are entitled to judge as they go along if that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. It's very natural. So my my general approach would be to be curious as to what brings them to this event, mm -hmm. whether that's a coaching conversation or a team building event. Um, ask them about their best hopes now that they're here. Mm -hmm. Give them permission to go at any time they think they've got something better to do. Mm -hmm. So really treat them respectfully as grown-ups. Uh, there's a saying in Solution Focus of go slower than the client. Mm -hmm. yep. so I'm, not, I'm not trying to push them anywhere or make them do anything. It's some stuff we can offer or talk about or reflect on. Mm -hmm. and go at their speed. And then something about what you said earlier 
that having a certain mindset or way of thinking about things can be contagious. Mm -hmm. So if we do an activity, let's say, about um, what connects us to our work or something we've enjoyed recently, just as an introduction of uh, something good that happened in the last week, and people start talking to each other, so you're building some interactions, and you can say, well, what, what did that do to the mood in the room? And people will just say, oh, well, we got more, uh, more excited and more energized. You know, oh, is that a good thing? Oh, yeah. And would it be good if we had that attitude and that approach to the um, challenges that you face as a business or as an organization or as a team? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it just continues with the next, yeah. the next step into that and um, engage people if they're willing to become engaged. Yeah. But if they're not, it's okay. Yeah, it's it's their process and their yeah their thing. But sometimes I feel there's so much leverage there, you know. I feel like ah, but yeah, I I also you know I I'm not pushing anyone. Uh, I got over that stage <laughs> that you feel like oh, every every single person has to get you know the full uh, yes. impact out of this session. Um, and also that you know it's also for me very interesting that. Every session I provide is is different, has different dynamics. And the best sessions are those that are not over-prepared, that are um, very present. I can see what's happening. I can tap into my own, you know, rucksack, my bag of of knowledge and different tools. And I'm not so focused on what I want to bring. I really unlock them. Yeah. So the first principle that I teach people of improvisation, I have this... What clip can you see that? Life, Life pass, let go, inhabit the moment, freedom within the structure, embrace uncertainty, play to play, accept and build, short turn taking, spot successes. Nice. That are your principles. One of those is let go. Yeah, and let go is we, we let go of the plan when we need to flex the plan, mm-hmm. just as you were saying. So, you can prepare a workshop, but you don't know until you're in it mm-hmm. how it's going to go. And also let go of perfectionism. Oh, yeah. that's. Uh, I'm happy I'm in this field because I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> me too. And I have to embrace the, this uh, person in yes. me sometimes. Yeah. So, I like you, you know, it would be wonderful if everyone got every workshop fully. But that's perfectionism. If it doesn't happen, it's okay. Yeah. Maybe a lot of people have got a lot of things from it and that that's, that is sufficient. Yeah, yeah. So we apply let go to yeah. ourselves as well. And then, um, you know, this whole yes and principle, and maybe you're, you're kind of tired of people diving into those more <laughs> critical questions. And I'm, not, I'm sure you know what's coming. Uh, but the yes and... How do we protect our boundaries if we say yes and all day? Or not literally, I understand, but in your mind, how you can you elaborate on that a little bit? I can. I think there's a confusion sometimes from theatre people mm-hmm. they think about applying improvisation. And to me, yes and is a very good stage technique to build a scene. Mm-hmm. If I say good morning, doctor, and the person says, I'm not the doctor, it's very difficult to continue the scene. So we teach people to say um, that they are the doctor and to ask how your leg is now. And you don't say, oh, it was my eyes. You talk about your leg. Mm -hmm. So you get standing by accepting and building each other's suggestions in the scene. And that's clearly useful for building improvisational scenes on stage that are more, more worth watching than ones that are negative and arguments that get very dull very quickly. Mm -hmm. So there's a principle and a skill that we can build of the yes ending, but it doesn't apply everywhere in life, Mm -hmm. in my view. So there's also a role for saying no. Somebody asked me something that conflicts with my values or that I don't want to do for some reason. No is a really good answer. Yeah. Um, Yes is a good answer. If someone says, there's a fire, get out of here. I go, yes, and just do it because it's important. So I'll teach people an experience of no, of yes, and of yes, and. Mm -hmm. Ask them, when is it applicable to use this attitude or that attitude or another attitude? Mm -hmm. Yes, but is very useful as well. 
So in applying improvisation, we need to know when to apply it and yeah. how to apply it. Any yeah. tool, you need to know when to pick it up, how to use it, and when to put it down again. Yeah, I love the way you put that because, you know, I, I was kind of, I was in a zone that, that I was thinking, okay, how can I facilitate this exercise in the best way? And then again, it was just asking you a question about what is your experience and when can you apply it and what what um, what challenges you more, saying yes, but, or hearing yes, but, or the no, because a lot of people find it really hard to to hear and know they take things personally for example sure. so there you have this you know over responsibility wants to be liked uh, all those limiting beliefs which goes pretty deep um and some people can really define themselves and i think i'm one of them as yes enders you know in life you know something happens in a synchronicity way for example and you say yes and and before you know you dive into a new adventure and your life gets uh, an extra uh, boost. Uh, and other people are way more yeah, risk uh, uh, adverse. Um, and yeah, that's why they walk the same path forever. And maybe they're happy about it. But often you feel like, hmm, I would love to do something that, that I really feel like doing. And uh, not so much following other people's path. So there's all these, yeah, these almost full of uh, philosoph uh, uh, philosophical topics and, and also psychology in, in that exercise, which makes it so interesting. Yes. Um, and also, yes, ending to situations that you didn't choose to be in, you know, and it overcomes you in a sense, uh, like a breakup or um, maybe you get fired on your work or somebody takes over a project you really love to do. Um, yeah, really look within yourself and accept it and not, you know, frustrate yourself and use all your energy for that, but use it for, okay, how can I improve myself to do it better next time? The principle that I have in Life Pass that we looked at a few minutes ago mm -hmm. is accept and build. So it is about accepting a reality. If, mm -hmm. for example, you've had a breakup or you've been fired or you find yourself in a situation you don't want to be. Mm -hmm. Accept the reality of it, here's where I am, and then inhabit the moment, and then see what you can build from that. doesn't mean you have to be positive about it. You can be yes. very sad, quite yeah. rightly so. Yeah. Life has ups and downs. Um, I'm yeah. writing now about resilience, of how you are more um, able to bounce back from things that don't go so well, or have fewer things happen to you because you're already stronger, so you're less knocked off course by things. Yeah, and it and it's not about, that's the difference between adaptability and resilience. It's not about bending back to the old status, no. but being in this new space, so really transform. I call yes. uh, I call it agility, um, yes. but you know it's it's all jargon in the end, in my opinion. Uh, yes. <laughs> but agility sounds nice uh, in the in it the is. context I'm working in. Um, so that's that's really interesting. Also, in the fields of climate change, you know that we radically have to change how we live, how we build and structure houses, and that has nothing to do with adapting because then it goes back to the old status. Do you know about the work that the Applied Improvisation Network is doing with climate change? No, I haven't dived into that. Right. I, so, wrote, uh, I wrote a thesis about it, so I kind of ignored that world for five years. I was so frustrated yes. because there's little impact you can make in such a huge topic. But who knows? Oh. Persuade me. <laughs> yeah. We've, the, the AIN has been hired by the... Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center. Nice. To bring more improvisation, playfulness, creativity into how they work with climate change and running projects, teaching people about climate change, teaching people to be more ready for things that might happen and also to deal with disaster when natural disasters occur. Yeah. And we've got a lot of practitioners in the network who have done bits of that work and they're all coming together in a two-day workshop immediately before the Oxford conference in August. Oh, that's amazing. To share the progress so far. The other thing that they really like is the way we facilitate as improvisers. 
to make meetings more exciting and interesting and to get mm-hmm. the message across. So there's a persuasion and impact through using activities and games that they're uh, very excited about. It's a, it's a huge piece of work, really, that's just beginning. And I'm, so, it, it, uh, I'm so happy and thrilled to, to hear about all these you know, projects popping up uh, in an organic uh, way. Um, mm. I used to work for the United Nations and I felt really Oops. stuck in the structure. And oh. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about my own experience. I'm not saying it's per se, it is a bureaucratic organization now. And I was working in New York. So, you know, this is headquarters. And I felt the structure was killing any possibility for me to explore my talents or what I mm. could improvise in a moment or innovate or improve. Uh, so I, I didn't know back then what was happening with me. I felt really tired and I was, I don't know if you've ever been in that spot. I don't hope so, but I was going to this downward spiral, like mm. feeling insecure, doing something worse. Uh, that work didn't turn out well. And before you know, you do not even know what you're capable of anymore. But wow. what, ha- what put my head uh, up high was that I was joining improvisation theater in New York at the mm. Albright Citizen Brigade, if I call yes. it right. And um, some people felt like when I came back from those sessions, like, wow, you're so energized and positive and what are you doing? And uh, they were quite curious, but they never, they went to see my performance, but they never, yeah, got into it so much. But uh, what, what I would like to emphasize is that for me, my journey is that I'm really glad that I can still contribute to this huge topics as resilience, climate change, uh, making the world a better place, but do it in in the way that really suits me. Yes, you've brought those things together in a way that makes much more sense, not only for you, but for these organizations. The United Nations is not an improvisational organization. (laughs) No, no, no. I hope... I hope one day that's still kind of my wish. I'm yes. not sure if it's my ego talking that I, you know, I can still do it. Or yes. if this is really something deep inside of me. I would love to go back to New York head, New York headquarters and train some of those decision makers or people that are in the spot and very influential about the outcomes of those big, huge resolutions they make. As, as we see with the, the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, there are organizations in influential positions who are beginning to see that this is necessary and yeah. finding finding ways of doing it by bringing in applied improvisers or people with similar approaches. And the organizations that don't get this in commercial terms, they're going to lag behind because they won't have the innovation and flexibility and adaptability and agility that they need to survive in a world that changes. Yeah. The length of The average length of time that an organization stays in the FTSE or one of the Standard & Poor Top 500s is declining every year. It used to be 70 years, you'd expect, for the lifetime of a successful company. It's now down to 10 years. Wow. And it will probably go down to five. Yeah. So organizations will change or new organizations will grow up and replace them. And it will be the improvisational organizations that have an edge. Yeah. The resilient slash agile slash improvisational organizations. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So another maybe critical questions that you might have heard before. Um, improvisation for people that, you know, just think about improvisation as doing random stuff in the moment and you haven't really prepared. And I'm always saying, wow, that's uh, it's a huge uh, bias because we mm. train quite a bit to improvise in the moment. Yes. So how can you translate to this to the corporate world where people are, you know, they have to perform, they have their KPIs, their targets, and how can improvisation help them? You know, do you have some way of, of putting this, of making it clear that it's just not just random things, we're not prepared and etc.? Yes, of course. There's, there's <laughs> lots, <laughs> yes. lots to say about that. <laughs> I uh, knew it. One good question is ask the people, does everything go according to plan? And I asked this to a group of manufacturing managers for one of the um, ethical um, cosmetics and soap companies. And these people that work with production lines and supply supply chains, they said, 
No. <laughs> Which plan? <laughs> Which, yeah, hardly anything goes according to plan. Okay, so the plan at that point no longer is serving you very well. And if all you're trying to do is get back to the plan, you're not recognizing what's real at the moment, and you're not responding to what's needed, and you're not using the resources that you've got in that moment. All of those things are attractive to do, and they are the improvisation skills. Yeah. So they, they were engaged immediately as being interested in what improvisation could offer them. Great. So if there is, because there's so much to say about this and you're writing books, I'm actually starting to write my own book in June. I hope you uh, have time to look into it. I'd love to. Yeah, it would be great. Um, what would be the the resource or the uh, fuel that has to be there um, that is key for improvisation to work in the best way it can between people? Well, first of all, there's there's no choice. Mm -hmm. It is an improvisational world. And if you describe the world in a way that doesn't include improvisation, then you don't have an accurate description. So to go back to what we were saying about the philosophy, we do co-construct the world between us. Yep. It is emergent. It has elements that will always be unpredictable. So... If we choose not to recognize that, mm -hmm. we're not going to engage in this kind of conversation or practice at all. If we do recognize it, then we can begin to articulate how things are in a more accurate way that takes account of improvisation, emergent forces, complexity, systems, and all these things. And then we can have sensible conversation about how do you make progress in a world that's like that. Yeah. And you make progress by setting a direction, knowing what it is you want and being able to recognize it when it's happening, using your resources in the moment, bit by bit, interactionally with other people, and then being very alert as to what's happening from all the feedback we get all the time that's telling us if we're on track or if we're not on track, and then adjusting and accommodating and coming up with new ideas to get more on track or to go faster if that's what we want to do. So the improvisational skills become central to the way that we make progress as individuals and as groups of people. Great. And Does that answer, answer that question? Yeah, no, I, I love the way, um, you know, I, I kind of asked a vague question, I realized, but I love it because it gives you such a different, makes me, uh, yeah, you give a different angle to what I was thinking myself. I was actually searching for the glue between people, like w what do you need between amongst people to... Uh to accept sure. that they don't have a choice and improvise and empathize with, with one and the other. I'm not sure that there is a, a glue. <laughs> what what happens, happens. Yeah, I was, uh, I was may more like, maybe you need, like, trust is always something that people resonate with, but need to trust each other, and then you can talk about your vulnerability and things that do not go wrong, and then you're more open to do another, to take another scenario um, in your work. But those all seem to me like extra steps that we don't need. Mm. So if you say, well, we need trust, then, and you say, have we got trust? They say, no. Then we've got to spend time getting trust before we can do anything. <laughs> I'd rather do something together from whatever position we're in now and see what that achieves. And if one of the byproducts of doing it is we now trust each other more, well, that's good too. Yeah. So it's taken care of, but it's not the focus. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I see you. You really take it, if I can call it like that, and correct me if I'm wrong, you really take it from a from a meta level, like uh, um, you treat the space as a, as a mechanism as a whole to move forward, and mm -hmm. every tiny little interactions that come along with that, as long as it's positive and constructive, um, yeah, it's kind of trusting that process as well. Oh, if, if it turns out to have given you something of value, you can trust it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to trust it in advance. I mean, I trust the processes I use because I've experienced them. Yeah. But I don't need anybody else to trust them and uh, beyond joining in and yeah. seeing how it goes. Yeah. So, yeah, there is a, a kind of meta level to that. 
Um, yeah, maybe I say this because I'm actually trained the trainers. So yeah. I actually train people to do the stuff that we are doing. Uh, yes. To transform practitioners. And what is the biggest challenge for people that just, you know, start to work in this field, which is kind of a leadership skill, you know, um, is that often they focus too much on the frameworks, on the outcome, and they do not really trust their process yet or the process. Yeah, well, uh, I'd like to be a little clearer. I mean, if mm -hmm. we are professionals offering to run something, yep. like a training course for trainers or a process in an organization, we need to have confidence in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's um, not ethical to <laughs> offer it. And, and it won't be well received because yeah. people like to see confidence in the people who are training them or leading them. For sure. So that's true. My... Um, Slight hesitation is about whether you need trust in a group for a group to do something and whether that's the thing to work on first. Yeah. I don't think it is. I think there's other ways of going about things that will create trust as you go along. You overemphasize it maybe. Is that also the, yes, there's an overemphasis on mm. abstract concepts and an underemphasis on what do we actually want to do here together, yeah. and doing it, which again seems to me very improvisational in a practical, active way of doing, um, often in preference to talking. Well, of course, talking is doing as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's nice. It's uh, because some people really get stuck with their jargon and how the world should look like. So let's focus on vulnerability. Let's be all more vulnerable. And I also feel like, wow. That, yeah, why? Why bother? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's watch a sad movie and then go along. Yeah. No, let's uh, just first do and then see. Maybe yeah. for you, it's not vulnerability you have to tap into, but it will be something else, you know? Be exactly. More bold even. Yeah. Yes. And, and you're probably tapping into a complex range of resources in order to achieve something. And labeling every one of those resources is not really necessary. Mm -hmm. If you did it, you did it. And you might want to reflect on what you did and how you did it. That's useful to do. But it's not the, it's not the main point. It's a, it's a byproduct or a point along the way. Great. So, um, we almost get at the end of this conversation. I think, uh, you know, we can have another, we can have a whole podcast channel about this, I'm sure. <laughs> but, and there will be, a, a, you know, a part two, for, I hope, in my case. Um, do you have, like, your, maybe your favorite, or maybe that sounds a little bit fancy, but some power question you use in the solution focus uh, concept that, you really champion. You love it. It always kind of works and it's yes. easy. You know, I have this with this, why do you do what you do kind of thing question to start a conversation yeah. that goes a little bit beyond, uh, you know, your function, your profile in life, which all the time constructs who you are. And I want to go beyond that. You're more than that. Uh, so do you have one of yourself? Um, I've got one on my card, on my business card. On the back of the card, it says, what do you want? Nice. Yeah. That's a core question for solution mm -hmm. focus. Yeah. Do Often you, people haven't been asked that. And do you also tap into the law of attraction, you know, the that part? What we pay attention to becomes more important and prominent. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's a, a, a there's nothing mystical about it. Mm -hmm. But in practical ways, if I'm thinking about the things that I want and start noticing those, yeah. Then I'm more alert and ready for getting what I want. Yes, if I'm yeah. thinking about what I don't want, yeah. then I notice the stuff that's going wrong, and that doesn't really seem to help me. Exactly. Yeah. So really, massage your own brain to see that uh, what will help you and, uh, and and transforms your your world in a positive sense. Mm. Yes. Beautiful. So, do you have anything you would love to emphasize? Uh, maybe invite people to join uh, the Applied Improvisation Network conference. Can you call out where they can find information? And yes. Um, the Applied Improvisation Network is free to join, and you do that on our new website, appliedimprovisation.network. And when you are a member, when you've signed up and made your own profile, then you can book a place at the conference and 
We've got more than 130 people have booked as we speak. So there's about 70 places left. And it's in August for three days. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you the days. Ooh, 70 places left. I have to buy yeah. this thing. <laughs> I think people need to move quickly because it will probably be um, full. Yeah. It's from the 11th to the 14th of August. And the 10th and the 11th of August is the humanitarian conference and also some other learning journeys where people can get an introduction to applied improvisation for one or other of those days and some other topics too. Nice. So if you make a good week of it, you'll have a fantastic time in Oxford. Wow. Wow. You really persuade me here. Great. Yeah. I've written it all down. Good. <laughs> so is there any questions or like a big bang, how you would love to end this, uh, wrap up this podcast, something you love to share, didn't ask, or you feel thrilled about? Um, I worked when I was a comedy producer with a Scottish comedian called Arnold Brown. And at the end of his show, he would say, if there's anything you haven't understood, please consider it significant. <laughs> This is how you get people, you know, frustrated, like, ah, <laughs> and grab their attention for sure. Uh, Todd Rundgren, the musician, he said, there's always more. Nice. I love that. There's always more. There's, there's no end, fortunately. Yes. Life is interesting. Okay. Thank you so much for, uh, for yeah, I, I want to say having us, having me, uh, you know, <laughs> for having this uh, beautiful dialogue conversation. I hope it inspired uh, people that listen to this podcast, as I always try to, you know, provide as much insights uh, for people that are in the field of leadership development or training, coaching, and uh, love to empower themselves to unlock the potential of, uh, of others, of their work environment or their lives. So thank you so much. And uh, let's, uh, let's have a next podcast soon, maybe after Oxford. <laughs>